Let's take a look at the details of the argument. At the beginning, he puts it this way. First premise. For a desire to be genuine, it has to be original and not contrived. Original and not contrived. Now, throughout this argument, there is a basic unclarity of certain terms, so we need to get precise about them. He gives us no definition of precisely what a genuine or, in his terms, urgent desire is, what an original desire is, what a contrived desire is. I think the idea is supposed to be something like this. Original desires are desires that I would have independently of the influence of other people on me. And a contrived desire is one that is produced by someone else. Now, when we frame it that way, we realize that that's, at first glance, <laughs> clear. We think, yes, I'm manipulated into having these non-genuine, these contrived, these inauthentic desires. Yes, that can happen. But I can also have genuine desires, desires that really are mine. I'm not being manipulated into having them. If I'm hungry and I want food, I'm not being manipulated into wanting food. That's a natural thing. It's inherent in me, innate in me, you might say, to feel hunger and then want food as a result. So those are nice paradigm cases of the two extremes. But there are lots of things in the middle. How do we classify those? For example, I desire all sorts of things that are, admittedly, due to the influence of other people. On the other hand, I'm not being manipulated by anybody in particular into them. I may not be manipulated into them in general. I have, since I was young, loved Baroque music, for example. I've studied the music of Bach. I learned to play Bach preludes and fugues on the organ. I've always been interested in Baroque music and in J.S. Bach in particular. No one contrived that. No one manipulated me. Nobody told me I must be interested in Bach or pressured me. If anything, the pressure was from other directions in the culture. But nevertheless, that was a cultural product. If it hadn't been for people like Moses Mendelssohn and many, many others over the years, preserving that music, uh, making it available for study, helping to publicize it, then I wouldn't have had that desire. And so, is that something that's contrived? Well, not if contrived means there was a contriver. Nobody contrived to give me that desire. Nobody manipulated me. On the other hand, it's surely not what I was born with. It's not innate. Moreover, it's not something I would have had independently of any association with other people. It required other people. J.S. Bach, for one, but all those other people who form part of the causal chain by which I found out about the music of J.S. Bach. So all of those things seem to me of a puzzling character. In fact, one of Hayek's criticisms is that surely, by Galbraith's criteria, all of that, all of the cultural interests of mankind, our interest in art, music, our desire for great literature, our desire for basically any cultural product at all, is going to count as an inauthentic, contrived desire. Well, maybe it does. I think it's unclear given the nature of Galbraith's argument, exactly how we should divide the contrived from the original, from the contrived from the genuine, etc. Suppose we wanted to characterize it a different way, and we wanted to say that by a contrived desire, we really mean a manipulated desire, something that is inauthentic, something that will not satisfy me, something that I've been given only due to pressure from someone else, manipulation by someone else. Well, we could do that, and that certainly is a paradigm case, I think, of what he has in mind. But it's not so clear, then, that the subsequent premises are going to turn out to be true, if that's right. You'll see what I mean when we move on to the second premise. But for now, I want to make it clear that, although it's somewhat ill-defined, precisely what counts as a genuine desire, an original desire, or a contrived desire, we do need the following to turn out for this argument to work. We need it to be the case that allocations of resources are misplaced as a result of our emphasis on these desires that he considers contrived. So at the very least, we have to say that Either it's more important that we satisfy genuine desires than contrived desires, or at any rate, it is more likely that our welfare will be improved as a result of satisfying a genuine desire than by satisfying a contrived desire. 
So it's either a comparison in terms of importance that genuine desires are more important than contrived desires, or that they're simply more likely to be satisfied, more likely to actually lead to an improvement in welfare. But we've got to have something there that is something like a normative difference between genuine desires and contrived desires. If there isn't in the end, none of this really will end up yielding the conclusion that he wants. So we need to say, whatever that distinction is, it's got to turn out to be the case that we're more likely to have our welfare improved by satisfying genuine desires than by contrived desires. Let's move on to the second premise. Premise two, companies sell by advertising. Well, okay, <laughs> companies sell by advertising. From one point of view, that seems obvious. Companies advertise their products. At least in general, this seems to be true. There might be companies, especially small companies, that really don't advertise. Um, a local bar, let's say, that does nothing to advertise. It's just there, it opens up, people stop in to check it out, some of them like it, and so on, the business continues. Or the local flower shop, or the local pizza shop. Um, maybe some things really get popular simply by word of mouth. Um, and there are lots of even large companies that started that way and have minimal marketing budgets. They don't really need to advertise. People know about them. They talk about them. It's all word of mouth publicity. And so not all companies sell by advertising. Still, it seems to be in general true that companies do sell by advertising. Premise three, advertising contrives wants. Advertising contrives wants. Now here is where we have to think very carefully about what contrives means. The idea is that advertising produces these contrived wants, these contrived desires. Presumably the idea is this, the advertising manipulates the consumer into desiring the product. But of course, that's an extreme case. A lot of advertising may be manipulative, but surely not all of it is. If I carry around a cardboard sign that says, eat at Joe's, or somebody dances around the side of the road saying, mattress sale this way, I don't feel manipulated by that. I'm just being informed by something. And so in general, we might say, well, some advertising feels manipulative, some doesn't. I mean, it depends. And we'll get back to that in a separate video. I'll talk a lot about the nature of advertising and ways of thinking about what it's doing. But for now, we could say, well, if we mean really manipulation, that seems like a rather strong premise. So what could we mean by contrives wants that would make this seem a little more plausible and to apply across the board to advertising rather than just to some specific misleading or highly manipulative ads? Well, we might put it this way. The point of advertising is to produce a desire for the product. Let's say I've got a pizza shop and I decide to advertise. I want you to want my pizza as a result. And so the point of the ad is to get you to desire my pizza. So if we think something more neutral here, rather than manipulate you into desiring my pizza, but simply, well, it might be inform you, might be persuade you, might be all sorts of things, but at any rate, produce a desire in you for my pizza. Then this seems plausible enough. Maybe contrives just means produces. Advertising produces desires, desires for the product. That seems like a very plausible claim. That is indeed its point, or at least part of its point, a way of putting the point. It might be an oversimplification, but it seems plausible enough. But then, of course, our distinction is this, that genuine desires are not produced in this way. That was the first premise. It's original and not contrived. And if contrived means produced, then premise one simply means that genuine desires are original with me. They are not produced by something, and in particular, not produced by advertising. It may be hard to find a reading that makes both of those clearly true, but let's assume for now we can find some reading of contrived and genuine such that we're willing to say, yes, genuine desires are not produced by something. They're in me already, and the point of advertising is to produce desires in me. What follows from that? Well, I think Galbraith produces two conclusions out of that. The first one, a kind of intermediate conclusion, is that companies produce in order to meet contrived desires. So companies produce, well, what? In order to sell things, 
They sell things by advertising. Advertising contrives desires. So companies produce to meet contrived desires. If we think about that chain of reasoning carefully, then I think we'll realize it's more complicated than we initially think. And so I'll come back to that when I talk about Hayek's critique of this argument. But at first glance, at least, it seems plausible enough. We could say, okay, genuine desires are different from, and we think more important than, or more likely to lead to satisfaction than contrived desires. Companies advertise in order to sell their products. Advertising contrives desires in order to sell those products. What do companies do when they produce? Well, they produce what they sell. They hope to sell what they produce. And so they produce in order to meet those produced desires. They produce goods, that is to say. They produce their products or they produce their services in order to meet those desires that they produce. But now maybe you can see why Galbraith worries about this. Because he can think, well, wait a minute. It's not that I have a desire. And then the company produces something that meets my desire. And yay, we're both happy. It's rather the company produces the product and produces the desire at the same time. And then you can think, wait, am I better off? Before, I didn't have that product. That desire wasn't satisfied, but I also didn't have the desire. And so you might think, actually, giving me a desire and then giving me something that satisfies that desire doesn't necessarily make me better off. Think about the drug pusher giving me the drug, inducing in me the desire for that drug, and then giving me more of the drug. You might say, I'm not better off as a result of having now had this addiction. I was better off before I had the addiction. And so the picture here is something like that, that companies are actually manipulating people into desiring their products. Then they're giving the, the products people now desire, but they're producing the desire as well as the product. Hence the dependence effect. The idea here is that the desire depends on the production. And so the company is producing the product and producing the desire for the product at the same time. The desire is produced as a desire for that product. So the desire depends on the product, not the other way around. It's not a question of the product depending on the desire. The company saying, hey, people want this, let's produce it for them. Instead saying, hmm, we know how to produce this. Let's produce a desire for that thing that we know how to produce and we'll make a profit. From that point of view, you can see why he's suspicious of these contrived desires, these desires that he sees people as being manipulated into, but even putting it more neutrally, the desires that he sees as being produced at the same time the product is produced, so that people are given a desire and given the product that meets the desire, and his question is, why should we expect that to make them better off? Before they didn't have the product, that desire wasn't being satisfied, but they also didn't have the desire to satisfy. And so, in short, they were no worse off. So meeting a contrived need or desire, responding to a contrived want, he says, cannot be expected in general to lead to an improvement in welfare. It's not simply that we might be making a mistake, that there might be long-term consequences, or anything like that. Instead, it's a more fundamental problem. We're being given a desire and then the product that satisfies the desire. Well that may or may not make us better off. At any rate, it seems like a strange misallocation of resources if much of society's time, effort, and money go into the production of these artificial desires that are then satisfied by artificial products. Better, perhaps, not to have had the desire or the product in the first place. Here, then, I think, is the general point of Galbraith's argument. When we produce a product to meet an original desire, a desire that people already have independently of our production of the product, then we can reasonably expect through free exchange that both parties will end up better off as a result of the exchange. Again, they might not for various reasons, but normally they will. When we're producing the desire at the same time that we're producing the product, however, when the production of that desire is something that depends on the product itself, we have no reason to expect that. We have no reason to think that normally an exchange will make both parties better off. It will presumably make the company better off. We have no reason to expect that it will make the consumer better off. And so I don't think we need to think about contrived here as necessarily 
a question of manipulation or of exploitation or of something itself that's morally tainted. The idea is supposed to be simply that if we produce the desire and then the means of satisfying that desire, we have no reason to think that someone who has a new desire and then has it satisfied is any better off than someone who simply does not have the desire in the first place. The kind of desire that is produced by advertising a product is not one that we can in general expect to improve people's welfare. The final conclusion that Galbraith is driving at is that society misallocates resources. Now, at first glance, you might think that's a surprising conclusion. Nothing we've said explicitly in the premises of this argument or in our intermediate conclusion has anything to do with the allocation of resources. Here's where we need to refer to that underlying assumption, the normativity of contrivance as opposed to a genuine desire. Basically, the idea has to be either that it's more important that we satisfy genuine desires, or at any rate, that satisfying genuine desires is more likely to lead to improvements in welfare than satisfying contrived desires. And now we can see maybe why he thinks that's true. We have a reason to think that if we are meeting uh, a genuine desire through economic exchange, the desire is independent of the existence of the product. And so there's a reason to think that both parties are better off as, the, as a result of the exchange. But when the consumer is being given the desire, at the same time they're being offered the product, then we have no reason to expect that exchange to make the consumer better off. The product is, in a sense, both the desire and the product that is meant to satisfy it. And you might think, look, before, okay, I have an original desire, aha, uh -huh, a product that satisfies my desire, I'm better off, I have a desire that's now satisfied. But if I'm being given the desire and the means of satisfaction, I may not be better off. And so as a result of that, he thinks that allocating so many resources, societally and individually, to that kind of private good that is the result of corporations producing a product and advertising the product to produce the desire for that product, that is not really something that improves welfare very much. Not as much as an investment in public goods. Now, what does he mean by a public good? There's a general distinction between private and public goods. Private goods are things that are used by one person. So my use of the good is something that precludes other people from using the good. I am right now using this camera that's in front of me. Other people can't use it right now. I'm using it. On the other hand, public goods are such that many people can use them and enjoy them at the same time. My use of them doesn't preclude your using of them. A good example is just the air we breathe. It's a public good. My breathing doesn't preclude you breathing. Water is like that. My drinking this glass of water, of course, means you can't drink this glass of water, but my drinking water doesn't mean you can't drink water. My walking through the park doesn't mean you can't walk through the park. And so public goods can be enjoyed by many people at the same time. Now here's his idea. Expenditures on public goods of that kind are more likely to lead to improvements in welfare, partly because many people can satisfy them at once, but mostly because they are not the result of that kind of manipulation or contrivance. Our desire for air, for water, for open spaces, for um, communion with nature, and so on, these are genuine desires. They are not the result of advertising. They are not being produced by somebody who is trying to instill that desire in us in the way that, for example, my desire for that particular food or that particular product is. And so he sees us in general as a society as investing too much, spending too much on private goods, which often are not really the kind of thing we can expect to improve our welfare overall, and too little on public goods, which can. Investing in clean air and water, in education, in parkland, in natural resources, in a variety of things of that general sort, he says, those are responding to genuine desires that people have in a way that a desire for, I don't know, um, Cheetos is not <laughs> something that responds to a genuine desire.